persons were all assembled on the little after portion of the deck, which is sacred to the cabin passengers. It was full. There was not room for any more quality folks. Another section of the deck, twice as large as ours, was full of natives of both sexes, with their customary dogs, mats, blankets, pipes, calabashes of poi, fleas, and other luxuries and baggage of minor importance. As soon as we set sail, the natives all lay down on the deck as thick as negroes in a slave pen, and smoked, conversed, and spit on each other, and were truly sociable. The little low seal sealed cabin below was rather larger than a hearse, and as dark as a vault. It had two coffins on each side, I mean two bunks, a small table capable of accommodating three persons at dinner stood against the forward bulkhead and over it hung the dingiest whale oil lantern that ever peopled the obscurity of a dungeon with ghostly shapes. The floor room unoccupied was not extensive. One might swing a cat in it, perhaps, but not a long cat. The hold forward of the bulkhead had but little freight in it, and from morning till night a portly old rooster with a voice like Balaam's ass and the same disposition to use it strutted up and down in that part of the vessel and crowed. He usually took dinner at six o'clock and then after an hour devoted to meditation he mounted a barrel and crowed a, a good part of the night. He got hoarser and hoarser all the time, but he scorned to allow any personal consideration to interfere with his duty, and kept up his labors in defiance of threatened diphtheria. Sleeping was out of the question when he was on watch. He was a source of genuine aggravation and annoyance. It was worse than useless to shout at him or apply offensive epitaphs to him. He only took these things for applause and strained himself to make more noise. Occasionally during the day I threw potatoes at him though an, through an aperture in the bulkhead, but he only dodged and went on crowing. The first night as I lay in my coffin, idly watching the dim lamp swing to the rolling of the ship and sniffing the nauseous odors of bilge water, I felt something gallop over me. I turned out promptly. However, I turned in again when I found it was only a rat. Presently, something galloped over me once more. I knew it was not a rat this time, and I thought it might be a centipede, because the captain had killed one on deck in the afternoon. I turned out. The first glance at the pillow showed me a repulsive sentinel perched upon each end of it cockroaches as large as peach leaves, fellows with long, quivering antennae and fiery, malignant eyes. They were grating their teeth like tobacco worms and appeared to be dissatisfied about something. I had often heard that these reptiles were in the habit of eating off sleeping sailors' toenails down to the quick, and I would not get in the bunk anymore. I lay down on the floor but a rat came and bothered me, and shortly afterward a procession of cockroaches arrived and camped in my hair. In a few moments the rooster was crowing with uncommon spirit, and a party of fleas were throwing double somersaults about my person in the wildest disorder, and taking a bite every time they struck. I was beginning to feel really annoyed. I got up and put my clothes on and went on deck. The above is not overdrawn. It is a truthful sketch of inner island schooner life. There is no such thing as keeping a vessel in elegant condition when she carried molasses and canicus. It was compensation for my sufferings to come unexpectedly upon so beautiful a scene as met my eye. To step suddenly out of the sepulchral gloom of the cabin and stand under the strong light of the moon, in the center as it were. 
of a glittering sea of liquid silver. To see the broad sails straining in the gale, the ship keeled over on her side, the angry foam hissing past her lee bulwarks and sparkling sheets of spray dashing high over her bows and raining upon her decks to brace myself and hang fast to the first object that presented itself with hat jammed down and coattails whipping in the breeze and feel that exhilaration that thrills in one's hair and quivers down his backbone when he knows that every inch of canvas is drawing and the vessel cleaving through the waves at her utmost speed. There was no darkness, no dimness, no obscurity there. All was brightness. Every object was vividly defined. Every prostrate canica, every coil of rope, every calabash of poi, every puppy, every seam in the flooring, every bolt head, every object, however minute, showed sharp and distinct in its every outline. And the shadow of the broad mainsail lay black as a pall upon the deck, leaving Billings's white upturned face glorified and his body in a total eclipse. Monday morning we were close to the island of Hawaii. Two of its high mountains were in view, Mauna Loa and Haluea. The latter is an imposing peak, but being only 10,000 feet high, is seldom mentioned or heard of. Mauna Loa is said to be 16,000 feet high. The rays of glittering snow and ice that clasped its summit like a claw looked refreshing when viewed from the blistering climate we were in. One could stand on that mountain, wrapped up in blankets and furs to keep warm, and while he nibbled a snowball or an icicle to quench his thirst, he could look down the long sweep of its sides and see spots where plants are growing that grow only where the bitter cold of winter prevails. Lower down he could see sections devoted to productions that thrive in the temperate zone alone. And at the bottom of the mountain he could see the home of the tufted coca palms and other species of vegetation that grow only in the sultry atmosphere of eternal summer. He could see all the climes of the world at a single glance of the eye, and that glance would only pass over a distance of four or five miles as the bird flies. By and by we took boat and went ashore at Kalua, Design, designing to ride horseback through the pleasant orange and coffee region of Kona and rejoin the vessel at a point some leagues distant. The journey is well worth taking. The trail passes along on high ground, say a thousand feet above sea level, and usually about a mile distant from the ocean, which is always in sight, save that occasionally you find yourself buried in the forest, in the midst of a rank tropical vegetation and a dense growth of trees, whose great bows overarch the road and shut out sun and sea and everything and leave you in a dim, shady tunnel, haunted with invisible singing birds and fragrant with the odor of flowers. It was pleasant to ride occasionally in the warm sun and feast the eye upon the ever-changing panorama of the forest beyond and below us. With its many tints, its softened lights and shadows, its billowy undulations sweeping gently down from the mountain to the sea. It was pleasant also at intervals to leave the sultry sun and pass into the cool green depths of this forest and indulge in sentimental reflections under the inspiration of its brooding twilight and its whispering foliage. We rode through one orange grove that had 10,000 trees in it. They were all laden with fruit. At one farmhouse we got some large peaches of excellent flavor. This fruit, as a general thing, does not do well in the Sandwich Islands. 
It takes a sort of almond shape and is small and bitter. It needs frost, they say, and perhaps it does. If this be so, it will have a good opportunity to go on needing it, as it will not be likely to get it. The trees from which the fine fruit I have spoken of came had been planted and replanted sixteen times, and to this treatment the proprietor of the orchard attributed his success. We passed several sugar plantations, new ones and not very extensive. The crops were in most cases third r ratoons. Note, the first crop is called plant cane. Subsequent crops which spring from the original roots without replanting are called ratoon. Almost everywhere on the island of Hawaii, sugar cane matures in 12 months, both ratoons and plant. And although it ought to be taken off as soon 